In 1947, India became an independent country after being ruled by the British for almost two centuries. The process wasn't an easy one. It divided the nation into three pieces, and the after effects of colonialism and partition was difficult to overcome for many years to come. Some that the country and its people are still haunted by. That sort of treatment for such a prolonged amount of time isn't going to fade away that easily. Its footstep can still be vividly seen in various sectors of this damaged place. The change it brought wasn't all doom and gloom. One of the movements that it gave rise to was the parallel cinema, a counterpart to the Italian neorealism, French, and Japanese new wave, which inspired a great array of Bengali directors. The most decorated filmmaker out of them all was Satyajit Ray. And then there are the likes of Ritik Ghatak, Mrinal Sen, Tapan Sinha, Bimal Roy, and various others who offered an alternative to the mainstream and commercial films. Amongst them, Ritik Ghatak is the one to be focused in here, an often underappreciated director who was one of the most technically and thematically innovative for his time, no matter under which lineup you place him in. A theorist at heart, majority of his films meticulously depicted and dealt with the social reality of ordinary people and the struggles they faced in that post-colonial era, whom he mainly concentrated on and commented his views about their situation. He saw filmmaking as the art form where he was able to express his anger that was a byproduct of the sorrows and sufferings of the ones who surrounded him, serving them in the only way he can and in a way became their sole representative. He was a tricky artist who can't be easily summarized in a video with limited resources that I'm handed with. However, there are certain elements which he made something of his own in a fashion that was remarkably impressive. So, here's an attempt to explain the brutal nature of his realism. Although they aren't interconnected, the three films that he released in the 1960s are categorized as the Partisan Trilogy. Meghe Dhaka Tara, Komal Gondhar, and Subarno Rekha all came out in the span of five years, the decade when parallel cinema was in its peak, spearheaded by his contemporary and mutual friend Satyajit Rai, both of whom had a deep respect and admiration for each other's work and what they were determined to achieve with this medium. However, the separation of India, particularly Bengal into two sections, West Bengal and Bangladesh, hit Ritik Ghatak way harder. Hence, majority of his work had that thematic motif either focused in the foreground or lingering in the background. Originally, I wanted to focus on all the three films, but I wasn't able to find Kamal Gondhar in a comprehensible quality to be used in here. And Suborno Rekha, on the other hand, is a bit complicated. Let's begin with the positives. The havoc that this split-up created can be easily assessed from the early sequences. People becoming homeless after the migration, further divided by being abducted and transported to different locations, breaking apart families and leaving them stranded until starvation consumes them, which is followed by numerous other allegories for what the people were forced to go through in those days. The constant changing of homes for out-of-reach factors stirs up majority of the issues in the lives of people we follow here where children are promised with lies to help them cope with it, akin to how the people were promised of better days after the separation, only to helplessly witness the wealthy and powerful to rip apart and snatch away their land. Old traditions and dated mentalities sprouting from believing in the caste system plays a huge role too, where people's hard-worked merit vanishes in a split second after others become aware of what make-believe caste they came from. Sita's brother, while being a righteous and truthful person, in the heat of the situation, is persuaded by such people who continue to abide by those societal rules and starts to act in a malicious manner towards the kid he adopted and his own sister whom he raised by himself. There are various other interesting points spread across in this film. One that left a lasting remark is that even though the people are surrounded by sadness and struggle, they have almost no interest in consuming works of similar nature and would rather opt for something more cheerful. 
which is the hard truth about people from such places. For them, it is first and foremost a source of entertainment, a means to escape from their damaged reality and not become engulfed by the world that betrayed them since birth. Even with all these hard-hitting messages and much-deserved praises, this method of filmmaking starts to sow its rough edges. Scenes feel a bit rushed or their purpose seems hazy at moments and characters' motives and their emotions have this unreliable, shaky feel to them. Suburno Rekha, while being the last in the trilogy, is easily outsigned by Meghed Hakatara, which is generally regarded as being the finest in his entire filmography and one of the best that the Bengali cinema had to offer. His unprecedented approach towards direction works better in here than it did in the aforementioned title. With his signature eccentric usage of camera angles and movements, he had the ability to visually arrest the viewers with his scenes and set pieces that felt more alive than others, using whatever limitations he faced to his advantage. And then there is the piercing utilization of sound effects to heighten the already daunting scenes that he captured immaculately. And altogether, he enveloped any given frame with ample amount of atmosphere, which is occasionally given more depth with his inclination of filming in dark lit situations or nighttime, and translated its innate beauty in a fashionable manner, giving the monochrome color scheme more character, which isn't an easy task to do. However, all of this is what can be seen on the screen. What is equally stunning is what is said in them. The tragedy of Nita is made apparent early on, about which even she is aware of, but in a way has accepted her ill-fated existence. A family, albeit loving, leeches off her earnings not only to survive, but fulfill their own demands. Apart from her father, hardly any family member truly appreciates or understands what she is offering to them by sacrificing her own life. The mother is concerned about their basic necessities. The younger brother and sister have always something they want, and their true nature becomes evident as time goes by. And while her older brother treats her far more humanely, he is completely reliant on her to achieve his dreams. It's not that they are immoral individuals, but more so how poverty has brought the worst out of them. A complicated predicament where each character basically piles up more issues onto the shoulders of Nita, leaves her to it and hopes she will somehow sort it out. Repeated phrases are an essential facet of this film. Some are used as a comedic relief. Some are used in different contexts which provides them with varying meanings that aligns with the situation they are used in. The one that stands out is this. Then make a glass case and place me inside like a wax doll. Everyone sympathizes with Nita, the owner of the general store, her apparent lover, and numerous other young adults from that place. However, nobody is prepared to do anything about it, or more so, know what to do. Nita herself doesn't want to live that way, but has no other option. She can't run away from her family and leave them to Paris under those conditions. She too had dreams and aspirations, and occasionally yearns for her fondly remembered, carefree childhood years, which she uses to mentally strengthen herself and not break apart, whose robustness is tested in every corner of her journey. The hardships she has to go through takes its toll. And yet, she champions through them with her head held high, all while being aware of what awaits for her in the end of the treacherous tunnel of pain and misery that was her life. But what is one to do? Place her inside a protective glass like a doll for eternity? Or let her live in that draining life of an educated woman from a civilized family who is sucked out dry until she has absolutely nothing to offer? Painfully, but flawlessly, the director concludes this in a horrifying note, illustrating the never-ending cycle of exploitation in that simulated life that is doomed to begin with, that has its ups and downs, however, hardly changes for the better who give their most. 
and yet they march on. A devastating tale that unfortunately reflects millions of Indians who live a perilous life only to receive a penniless death. Slowly and steadily, the desire and drive to be alive is taken away until the star that once shone so bright diminishes under the darkness of those suffocating clouds. The following titles, while being separated by 15 years and structurally distinct from each other, are united with the help of a humane theme. Ojantrik and Titas Ektinodir Nam were one of the first and last films in his career that only lasted for two decades. Conceptually, Ojantrik in every sense of the word was groundbreaking, which was made easily digestible by being packaged as a comedy drama. However, underneath all those amusing series of events that the protagonist faces, the way an inanimate object is treated as a living and breathing character is what leads to some of the memorable moments. The taxi isn't just a means he uses to sustain himself, but it is a core and vital piece of his identity. Without Jagodol, Bimal can't exist. An unsocial, poverty-stricken man stranded with his special machine in those rapidly advancing times of post-independence India. Modernized industrialism uprooting the same people for whom the so-called development was done. And this is what connects both of these films. In here, it is the titular river, Titas, which isn't a mere water body. For the people situated in nearby villages, it is everything. A place of worship, a mode of transport, and a source of income and nourishment. It is one of the critical characters upon whom majority of the plot points revolve around, and is used as a vehicle to advance the overarching story, or switch between the characters whose life are interlinked in so many ways than they are ever made aware of. At moments, it takes away what feels like everything, but gives something back in return. Its prosperity is what has kept the villagers united since its inception, and its death after it dries up is exactly what dismantles it. Nature is always fair and just with its treatment, and the river is utilized as a metaphor for what happens, or what actually happened, when outside forces try to control it, which is bound to lead to the demise of unaccounted number of lives. In this case, it's the money lenders, aka the one with wealth and power, toying around with the livelihood of defenseless fishermen, destroying their shelter and cornering them near a dried up river that is only capable of leaving them with faint memories of the past. Archaic traditions and the inability to change with the course of time is another element that can be a commonality between this and Ajantrek. After all, it begins with a young girl being overwhelmed with whom she's ought to marry, and the next character, after being briefly introduced, is married off to a man without being acquainted with his name or face. The lack of consent or being old and mature enough to comprehend what marriage actually is or can be unifies these two characters, who are ingrained with the notion that a woman's value is nothing without a man. Even though sisterly love and its empowerment helps them to persevere through whatever life throws at them, their stern demeanor was the answer that they were looking for in other men. All of the trademark elements that the director was renowned for is present in here, and although it suffers from it at moments, when examined from a farther distance, it does more wonder to the film than harm. The damage is done in a larger extent by the runtime of the film, and in the process of accomplishing the ambitious narrative structure, which gets wobbly in its adventurous path. Nonetheless, it is a melodramatic tale with unpredictable waves of catastrophes. As I said in the beginning, Riti Ghatok isn't an easily understood artist. His work is far from perfect throughout the duration of time it stretches for. Sound design while being surrealistically used, at several instances it feels a bit out of place or badly mixed in post-production. Same can be said for the cuts in between certain scenes or the dialogues in them. 
the motivation behind them or why those decisions were made can be somewhat confusing and the patterns can't be studied to a satisfying degree. However, his chaotic and rupturous style generally worked in his favor, elevating the expressionist and realism values of his film, which is what he is widely celebrated for. A poet with a damaged soul trying his utmost best to visualize the ailments of his people. And much like the characters of his work, the burden of his surrounding took the best of him. His personal life was far from ideal. The commercial failure of his films and the complications that it created pushed him to alcohol to deal with his despondency. Nagorik, his first feature-length project and considered the earliest art film in the Bengali cinema, though being completed in 1952, only saw its release after his death. Stolen of the privilege of being bestowed with that title and receiving his flowers when he wasn't there to accept them. A self-educated creator was far more invested in his creation than what came of it. The emancipation of constrained emotions and pain that it imparted was far greater in value than anything the world could have ever offered him.